of Nevada Reno Informational Phillips Street with the University of Nevada Reno will provide a presentation on the results of research work conducted in northwestern Nevada and south central Oregon on the effects of wild horse use as well as cattle grazing on greater sage grouse demography and Mr. Espinosa you're going to introduce us to Mr. Street uh, yes madam chair uh, for the record Sean Espinosa with Nevada Department of Wildlife Upland Game Staff Specialist I just wanted to give the commission uh, a little bit of context here and a little bit of background. Uh, Philip Street just completed his dissertation and has a, a postdoc position at the university now, but um, his uh, major professor, Jim Sedinger, and I uh, discussed the opportunity for this research project um, oh, about seven or eight years ago, basically, when, when horses were being removed from the Sheldon. Uh, or being proposed to be removed from the Sheldon, we knew it was an opportunity to try and gain some knowledge on the before and after effects uh, on greater sage grouse, um, as well as to try and, um, we had some opportunities from nearby areas because we had a control site at Hart Mountain that didn't have horses and didn't have cows, and then we wanted to take the opportunity to use some of the outlying areas around the Sheldon uh, to study the effects of both uh, and where we just had cattle. So um, Philip's going to give us a, a, a presentation and uh, represents basically seven years of research in that project area. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Philip. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to present this work to you guys. I really put a lot of effort into it and I'm proud of it, so I'm glad people are interested. Um, so when I'm talking about these interactions, I'm talking about greater sage grouse, livestock, and feral horses. Um, and to really understand the scope of the problem, I just like to look at a map of sage grouse distribution in the entire U.S. Then I can overlay that with BLM's permitted grazing allotments. And then again with the herd management areas and herd areas being managed for feral horses. These areas don't include the 10 to 20,000 horses that are off of these HMAs. And it doesn't include the roughly 100,000 horses that are on tribal lands either. But if we look at this map, we see that it's affecting almost the entire range of greater sage grouse. And no other threat to sage grouse has this scope um, in terms of management possibilities and actions. Yet we know little about how they're actually affecting sage grouse populations. So my study area, Sean just described it. We've got Hart Mountain National Wildlife Refuge and Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge which offers some different grazing regimes. Hart Mountain's been horse and livestock free. Sheldon has been livestock free since the early 90s. And then horses were, a big effort was put in to have them removed completely by 2014. And they're essentially horse free at this point. And then we worked on adjacent BLM land and the massacre and via sage grouse population management units. Okay, and so the start of our question was simple. Do livestock and horses alter the herbaceous vegetation characteristics? And does this result in adverse effects to sage grouse? So we went out and we marked a ton of sage grouse and we followed them throughout the entire nesting and brood rearing season to see if it was affecting their reproduction. We did vegetation surveys at each nest site location, each brood site location, as well as random locations to see what was available for the grouse to be choosing. And this resulted in almost 3,000 vegetation surveys. We also went out and surveyed the landscape for fecal abundance. And this is species of livestock and horses. If we look at this picture, we see different amounts of feces of different age groups from both species. And so this was a big question that came up to me was, what does feces really mean on the landscape? And what's the age of the feces? And so if we look at this picture, we see some feces that I know, because I know how the livestock were permitted on this meadow, is exactly one year old. 
This is a highly productive area. This is a grazed meadow. It's grazed at the end of the growing season, and livestock aren't permitted back on this meadow until after this year's fall growing season. And so if we look at this picture, we fast forward two weeks in time, and we see that the feces is pretty much almost entirely gone, whereas in some of the upland habitats on Sheldon, we're still seeing feces, even though there haven't been horses there since 2014. And so this meadow in particular that I'm showing, Bittner Meadow, will be instrumental in this talk. And it's known to be an important resource for sage grouse once the landscape dries up. So one management strategy has been to hold the livestock <coughs> off of this meadow um, and graze it down after sage grouse have utilized it. That's a, a good strategy, but one problem with that strategy is now the livestock are in the uplands. And the uplands are where the sage grouse nest, and if a nest is successful, like this one in this picture, then the chicks that hatch out of that nest are limited to the area right around the nest. You can see these one-day-old chicks, they're not going to move very far. And just a side note, this is how we collected our, our data on the broods. Um, it allows us to really get a, a really accurate count, as well as to see what the, the birds are foraging on. And we know from this paper that's also out of our group that these birds that are able to transition to a forb diet quicker um, from insects are going to do better, they're going to grow faster, and survive at higher rates. Also, we know that most of the death of these chicks happen within the first three weeks of life. So for these meadows to become important to the birds, they have to first survive so they can go to the meadows to utilize them. And so when you have a large herbivore like this feral horse foraging on forbs, it's in direct competition for the sage grouse. Okay? So we know that horses are on the landscape, but we also know they're not evenly distributed. They're keying in on certain features of the landscape. So we wanted to map out where these horses are. And to do that, we used remotely sensed imagery um, to use things that we thought could be important to the horses. And so distance to water, solar, this is how much sun a, an aspect and slope receives, uh, topographic position index, so that's how rough the landscape is, the amount of sand that's in the soil, uh, NDVI, which is a measure of greenness, so how green the landscape is. And then for livestock, we use animal use months, so these are build allotment data. And then for horse management areas, we just treated those as different among each other. And so one of the things that came out as being really important is distance to water and bare ground. And this came out as a, an interaction, meaning that if there's a lot of bare ground that we see in this photo right next to water, then we're predicting there's going to be a lot of feces there. It makes perfect sense. We saw horses and livestock using permanent uh, stock tanks on the, the landscape. So we considered those to be water sources. And so if we talk about where livestock are on the landscape first, we modeled it through time. And the take home from this message is that livestock distribution isn't changing much through time, but it is different across the landscape. And if we look at the results of the feral horse model, we see that this is changing some through time with the bulk of our horses starting in 2014 up on the northern end on Sheldon and adjacent land. And then it's really starting to increase in the southwestern part of our study area towards the end of our study. So then we went out and we surveyed the landscape at both sage grouse use points as well as the random points. And so this slide shows the results we found from our vegetation surveys when there's no livestock or horses. And what we see is that 
Sage grouse are choosing to nest and raise their broods in areas with more perennial grasses, areas with less annual grasses. In our study area, when I'm talking about annual grass, I'm talking about cheap grass. Um, more key forbs, so these are forbs that we know sage grouse chicks are eating, and more other forbs. So basically, they're choosing to nest and brood in more productive areas. So when we introduce livestock to the, the landscape, and we increase the number of feces, we start to see perennial grasses declining. So this is amount of cover of perennial grasses. These are green because we know that they're good for sage grouse. We see a similar result for the key forbs. The other forbs, we see similar results. Um, annual grass, so cheat grass, was relatively low, and it remained low in areas where we had high amounts of livestock grazing. And then we started to see large increases in bare ground. And so if we put all of these results on one slide, we see all the things we know that are good for sage grouse going down and increases in the amount of bare ground. And so it's one thing to see this on a graph. It's another to see it out on the landscape. And so this is a grazing and holdment or a exclosure next to Boulder Reservoir. This is one of the areas we have high amounts of sage grouse. We also have high amounts of livestock use. Inside the exclosure, you can see high amounts of perennial grasses and forbs. Outside the exclosure, you see almost no understory, with the exception of a few lupin, which are toxic to livestock. And so in this picture, we see a nesting sage grouse. And our next question was, did this transition into adverse effect on the survival of sage grouse? And the answer is no. It did not translate into adverse effect. However, if we look at what happens when the sage grouse nest hatches, we saw an adverse effect being translated to those young chicks. And so we've got daily chick survival on the y-axis and the number of cow feces on the, the x-axis. Okay, if we look at the results from feral horses, we saw that the perennial grasses were decreasing substantially. Um, if we look at the key forbs, we see pretty much the same effect. The other forbs, the same effect. And then if we start to look at the amount of bare ground, this is where things get interesting. So at the, the habitat that's available to sage grouse, we saw that those plots with lots of horses were transitioning mostly to bare ground. If we look at the areas where sage grouse were choosing to build their nest and raise their brood, they, it was going to basically zero. So how can this be? All the herbaceous cover goes to zero and the bare ground? And the reason is because those plots were transitioning entirely to cheap grass. And so if we put that all on the slide, it becomes pretty apparent and what's happening is that sage grouse are choosing for any cover that's available, and the only cover that's available is cheap grass. And we see that within this, this picture, and it's pretty much transitioned to cheap grass monoculture. So, did this transition to an effect on sage grouse nest survival? And the result is no, it didn't. And this wasn't super surprising for me, because if you think about what the birds are doing during this time period, they're inside the middle of a bush trying to be concealed. The vegetation's growing up around them. Um, and so what would be the mechanism? But again, when we look at what happens to the chicks after they hatch out, there's nothing left for them to eat. If we think of those videos I just showed, we can see the birds trying to forage on the, the cheap grass and they're just spitting the seeds out and then they die, basically. Um, so, in summary, livestock are reducing the vegetation. It's not translating into an effect on nest survival. It is slightly on chick survival. Feral horses are reducing the vegetation. Sage grouse are choosing to nest and brood their chicks in areas with high amounts of cheat grass, and this is resulting in 
significantly poor sage grouse chick survival. So recruitment into the population just isn't happening. Um, so what do we do about it? And so one thing that we can do is map out where these birds need for their resources to produce chicks. And to do that, we need to kind of go back to the sage grouse new year. This is the lecking season. This is where it all starts for sage grouse. We see two females. Um, one has a radio collar on. From our work, we're finding that these females are most likely related to each other. They have similar behavior. They're going to the, the same spots year after year. And their chicks that survived the next year's breeding season are going to those same spots. So then they go and they build a nest. That's the period I just talked about. They hatch their chicks. And then at some point, those upland habitats dry up. And these birds have to move towards a moisture-rich refuge to finish out the summer to raise their chicks. So we modeled where this habitat is on the landscape. We did it by a lek level. Because, as I just mentioned, those individuals from one lek are behaving similar to each other. And we can see two different leks here. Top left is Fatty Martin early brood rearing habitat. The top right is their late brood rearing. And we see that all the birds, these are the gray dots on the map, the blue points are the leks themselves, have to go to an area. That area is Bittner Meadows. That became really important. This lek on the bottom is a lek on Hart Mountain that has all the resources the birds need. And the birds don't really have to move anywhere, and they don't move. So having these individual let type habitat maps allows us to build an adaptive framework that allows to ask very specific questions. And so an example of that would be, within my study area, what habitat is most important to sustain the leks and populations of sage grouse that we have? And so I built that model and I ran that query and we found that about 5% of the landscape is classified as high quality early brood rearing and late brood rearing. And so that's basically a quick summary of the research that I did for my dissertation. And I want to expand this tool basically to an adaptive management tool to be integrated with Endow's LEC database. This allows us to start weighting each lek for the number of males that are attending. And it also allows us to expand this to the rest of the state. And so that's what I've been applying for funding to do um, over the, the last few months. Um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has committed $30,000 to seeing this tool be developed. Greater Hart Sheldon Conservation Fund has committed $18,000. And then we submitted a proposal to the Heritage Fund, which I'll let you guys talk about later. Um, beyond this tool, um, we've successfully had a proposal funded to do, continue our research in this same area, but it's to try and quantify the function and role of meadow vegetation on greater sage grass population declines. And so we isolated five meadows that were identified throughout our research to direct this work to, um, Divine Spring, Bittner Meadows, Hell Creek, this meadow is on Sheldon, we'll talk about it more in a minute, Mountain View Stream, and Grassy Meadows. And these all have different grazing regimes associated with them. And so I said I was gonna talk more about Hell Creek on Sheldon. This is one of the areas that was heavily impacted by horses. If we look at the, the satellite imagery, from the top in 2015, this is one year post horse removal. We can see that a lot of this meadow is completely bare dirt. Um, fast forward two to three years and we can see the vegetation starting to come back. This vegetation has come back at this point in this picture, it's mostly tansy mustard. Fast forward two more years to when we're actually conducting the research starting now it's transitioned back to more native uh, perennial grasses and forbs. 
However, it's not a grazed meadow, so there's a, a lot of standing dead vegetation within this meadow. So it's not as productive. It doesn't produce the same amount of biomass that Bittner Meadow does that has this late season grazing. Um, but Sheldon being a wildlife refuge, we get, it allows us to investigate which of these types of meadows or management strategies is best for wildlife. Um, at the same time, this is a picture of Divine Spring. You can start to see a pipe rail fence that went into place last summer. This is a, a meadow and a fencing project that I worked with Sean and Mark Fries with to get put in place. Um, and I learned a lot throughout this process, mo mostly that it takes a really long time from the conception of one of these ideas to get it and put into place. And so that's why I think that tool that's going to allow us to predict the success of a fencing project is going to be really important. And so with that, I just wanted to say that this has been funded by a lot of different agencies um, and we're really grateful for the funding we have. Um, and I'll take some questions at this time. And so, one thing I want to mention before I start taking questions is this is not a, a picture, it's a video. This is a sage grouse within Bittner Meadow. The stationary one is a hen. She's sitting there looking around for predators and you can see her chicks foraging about in that meadow. Um, and this is kind of highlights the importance of cover for these birds. So thank you for Thank you, Dr. Street. Um, does anybody have questions for Philip? No questions? Okay, Commissioner Hubs. So just based on the, um, I'm gonna talk with my back to you, so just forgive me. <laughs> but based on the um, data and what we saw, uh, we're finding that both the horses and the cattle negatively impact the chick survivorship, correct? That's because correct. they're transitioning the landscape um, by w making it like a barren area and then we're having invasives come in and they're not providing the right nutrition for the chicks? That's correct. So uh, if you have cattle, they're typically, are these areas... Um, private lands or their public lands, they have like permits to go out and graze the cattle? This is all Bureau of Land Management land um, with permittees out there grazing the cattle, that's correct. And then the horses we know are also managed by the BLM, correct? So um, what are the strategies or implications? I mean, it sounds like it's I mean, especially in light of the recent litigation. I mean, we have the litigation under the Endangered Species Act. We have, we saw our report on the sage grouse and the numbers kind of struggling. Then we have all the fires. What is the BLM going to do or what are the recommendations from the study to assist protect the habitat that's at issue? Great, thank you for that question. So. A key difference between the way livestock and horses are managed is that livestock can be moved um, and they can be grazed in the way that we decide that they're grazed. By we, I mean the BLM and the permittee. They work together to establish these grazing permits and when it's going to happen. So they can be controlled, whereas the, the feral horses on the landscape they can't be moved around off the landscape, and the only management tool we have is removals. And so, if you look at my presentation and you look at the photos of the horses, you see some very healthy horses. And that's because a lot of the areas where horses are, it's because they're growing populations of horses and they haven't started to reach um, their carrying capacity. So some of the other parts of the range that we have, many parts in Nevada where the horses are two to 300 times AML, so appropriate management level, 
places where you're seeing horses starting to starve to death. By the time the horses get there, there's nothing left for the wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to trap sage grouse and mark sage grouse in those areas, but you just can't get the sample sizes needed because they're not there. So I've recommended to the BLM that they focus their removals on areas where we still have wildlife and intact habitat. And there is a removal scheduled to be done this fall within the Surprise Valley in that area where I showed where we had these large increases in horses. So if we continue to get our research funded and continue to do our research there, that'll help to answer these questions of how beneficial can a removal be. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Cavilia. I, I guess I guess it's not a surprise to anybody about how detrimental the horses are. I don't. Um, the question I have, and it might be more for the department, but I know, like right now, the horse and burrow. I think they're they have a committee or an oversight committee. They have a public comment period, and I know we play nice with the BLM, but do we ever? Does the commission or the department ever comment during periods like that regarding the horses? You know, or or. Or does the department need to push the issue further? I know we want to play nice with the BLM, but the um, the uh, the other side doesn't play nice, right? They 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 sue the they sue the BLM when they try to round the horses up. I think the last thing we heard is Nevada. We're four we're four times over the AMLs, and I mean, I mean they, do we do we have to push back harder on the BLM? I know I know we want to play nice with the BLM, and we do play nice with the BLM, but is the horse issue an issue where? We need to ratchet it up, I guess. And I mean, there's other states probably that would want to ratchet it up as well, because, because like you said, you go to parts of eastern Nevada, and I mean, it's scorched earth now from the horses. I mean, it's absolutely scorched earth, um, and it's just like it stays the same, and the horse numbers keep going up, and they they seem to do captures, but I don't know if they really do much, you know. So, those are just my my thoughts on it. Vice Chair Barnes. Thank you, Commissioner Keenan. Kind of a response to uh, to your question is that the BLM right now is actually ratcheting up, and um, and they do have a plan. They have an, have an aggressive five-year plan to get horses down to AML. However, they don't quite have the funding to to meet that, but they do have a 10-year plan. And if they can stick with it, then, then hopefully in 10 years they're going to be down there. I mean, along with the gather, they're talking about some fertility control. To, uh, to work on. So it, it is happening right now, um, and, and they have been working. It's taken them a long time to get to this point, but, uh, but there is some, is some work getting done, and, and it's gonna take a while. And you know, and the, the sad part about it is, and uh, the livestock industries, we've been pushing you know, this horse issue for a number of years, that, you know, that even once the horses are gone, the damage is already done. I mean, there's a lot of places that livestock have been gone for, for years. Even and uh, but the sad part is, yeah, we can remove the horses, but but there's a lot of damage that's already been done, and it's going to take take years to get back back to where we need to be. So so we're make, we're making progress. Um, it's probably taking longer than we should, but uh, I guess I guess we are where we are, and um, you know we there's been obstacles that we've had to deal with to get to get to this point, and it's too bad that that it's taken this long. To, uh, to get where we are and, and uh, how to see things deteriorate to, to the point that, that it's gotten this way. So. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, with your, your, you mentioned the term uh, adaptive management. Uh, so you're hoping to develop strategies that can be used by cattlemen and stuff to move their cattle around the the landscape is that is that really what it's focused on and or the feral horses or um, help, help me understand what your ultimate goal is with the the adaptive management concept that's right so um, this is something that Sean and I've had quite a few discussions over but the idea is to take the information that we've learned from <clears throat> removals um, and moving livestock around in the landscape, see how it translates into habitat response. As of now, we can do that um, through the satellite imagery. 
um, this project that's currently going on and has people in the field allows us to get a finer resolution and start to quantify the difference between a green meadow that's occupied with tansy mustard and a green meadow that's full of perennial and key forbs. Um, so that information will be able to be incorporated into the management tool. But it'll specifically, the adaptive part is, it will allow NDAO and ODFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, any of the managing agencies that want to use this tool to ask specific questions. So we can ask a question like, where's the best habitat to maintain current sage grouse populations or current legs? And that, that's one thing. We could say, okay, there's been a huge decline in the via population management unit. Where can we devote our resources to the, uh, the most number of sage grouse? And so when we asked that question, I, I stated that one specifically because I've run it through the tool. And it becomes out to be about a half a percentage of the landscape to maintain the most amount of sage grouse. Um, so it really allows you to tailor the questions you ask of the tool, and it will be part of NDAO's LEC database and linked directly to the access database. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but yeah. Oh, th thank you, and the, the reason I asked is, you know, there, the, one of the former uh, ranch representatives on the commission um, uh, was very active with their BLM uh, person in uh, managing their allotments and stuff so they would go out and manipulate habitats in conjunction with their their representative you know in, co in collaborative fashion and um, I can tell you that we we got to do a tour in some of the areas that they had worked on um, no, no small deed to get that kind of stuff done in a collaborative manner by the way um, you know it was it really did enhance the opportunities for um, both the, the sage grouse and the uh, um, and the, the ranching uh, aspects. Basically, there were opportunities to make improvements for everybody. And, uh, you know, I see, I, I hope that this tool um, helps with that, continues to build on that platform because it's, uh, um, you know, it's my understanding that, that, you know, that in your late brood rearing for sage grouse, you've got to have, where's Sean? I'm trying to, that, that moderately grazed meadows are important, um, <coughs> that, that they can be more productive. Is that right? And I'm not advocating for grazing everywhere. That's not my, my deal. But um, I'm just saying that there are benefits to, uh, to you know, um, everything's in moderation, I guess. But there are benefits to, they, they can be um, maybe enhanced by, with these, uh, with these tools. Uh, thanks for the, the statement question, uh, Commissioner McNinch. Um, I guess my response would be, um, I'll start out with Upland Game Staff Specialist Sean Espinoza for the record. Um, you know, there's, there's a balance here that we need to, to seek out. We have the situation with Bittner Meadows where it, it is a grazed meadow. It's grazed at the end of the brood season, and we're finding that there's success with that. But the, the opposite end of the spectrum is, is the uplands probably aren't as in good shape as they potentially could be. So is there some alternative ways we could move cows about the landscape and get some better response on the uplands and still uh, retain the value we're seeing in, in the brood habitat? What you saw in that video there is these grouse going to these meadows, they're getting cover. Um, it's, it's really an, an optimal situation um, and, and some of the older literature that's out there, oftentimes it was observation only. They didn't have the, the same type of technology that we have today with GPS transmitters and VHF telemetry and graduate students following basically from the time they put a nest on the ground all the way through um, brood success. Um, so what you saw is observational uh, indices on the landscape. And you can see grouse on a, on a pretty impacted meadow. You can't necessarily see grouse like you saw in that picture uh, in, a, in a moderately to 
ungrazed meadow. So I think there was some things that were missed back in the early days with respect to um, the thought process on you know how grouse were using these meadows. Um, so there is some some balance that I think we wanted to seek out and in northern Washoe County um, and, and western Humboldt County there's certainly a lot of things that I think could be done to improve the landscape that wouldn't require you know hopefully that much but um, some of these places um, experience a season of use that goes from April 1st all the way until October 31st and in my honest opinion that is that is way too long of a period of use is there some alternative strategies that could benefit the permittee um, but also work from from a livestock stand or a, a wildlife standpoint as well and sort of minimize uh, some of the effects that we're having on some of these meadows that are experiencing season long use thank you yeah it's it's complex there's no doubt about it any other questions Vice Chair Barnes just <clears throat> Just, just some comments that, that Sean kind of alluded to. You know, in the livestock industry, we refer to, uh, you talk about grazing from April 1st to October. You know, we kind of talk about that as being the, the Columbus method. You turn them out in the spring and you go rediscover them in the fall. And, and a lot of us have, you know, we've, we've progressed a long ways um, since that with our rotational systems and stuff that we have now. But, and, and we're, we're getting closer, but we still need flexibility in our grazing permits. You know, a lot of our permits are from a certain date to a certain date. And, and we're not allowed to graze outside those dates, regardless of whether it's a benefit to your, to your livestock, the range, wildlife, whatever. And so we, we need to build some flexibility in these permits. And, and we've been working on this for a long time, and, and we're getting closer. But uh, we're, we're still not there yet. You know, we've got... You know, I mean, Sean knows a lot of this. We're talking about targeted grazing, um, outcome-based grazing, where when we turn our cattle out, we're, we're, you know, we're grazing for a certain outcome, whether it's to increase perennials or, or do whatever, or fuels reduction. But, but we need to, we need to get uh, further down the road on that. And, uh, and we're, we're getting there, but it, it's a slow process. It's going to take a collaborative effort and everybody to get there. But, uh, but I think we're moving that direction, and if we're going to be successful, you know, that's... That's, that's what we need to do. Um, you know, Sean you know, we talked about earlier, but I am going to mention, you know, that, that when sage grouse numbers were the, were the highest in the state, so were livestock numbers. You know, it's, that's all, you know, they're going to say it's anecdotal, you know, stuff, but, but there, there could be, there, there's something to it. I mean, there, and it's not just one thing, but there, there's a multitude of things. But, but that is, that is something, and uh, like I say, we got a ways to go, but we're we're st we're still getting there. Thank you, Commissioner Hubs. Just in terms of the, it was interesting that you weren't doing counts of the horses or the cattle. You were using feces as an indices, and we know that. I guess my question is, how much do their feces spread the exotic? plants is that a problem and then I remember you know the cow has a more complex digestive system than a horse and so I, I just I'm wondering too if there's an issue with that um, I know the bare ground obviously the invasive species is going to come back and take place of native plants but are the um, horse and cattle also spreading the invasive species by, by their feces? I mean, in, invasive species by their feces? Um, <laughs> yes, I, I understand your question. Um, Philip, could you sit at the mic, please? Sure. Thank you. So, yes, there's um, cheatgrass present across much of our study area. The reason we're not seeing it in areas with high livestock use is because livestock are eating it. Um, to, directly get at your question, can it be spread through the feces? Um, Sarah King out of Colorado State University has done research on this, and she's found that it can pass through a horse and germinate somewhere else, wherever the, the horse deposits it. So, um, yeah, they can be spreading it as well. Okay. Oh, sure, Commissioner Cavilla. 
I guess I, we got kind of got sidetracked. So just my question for the department, do, do we get any, I know we can't control the horses as all they're outside of our scope, but do we comment at all formally to the BLM regarding their horse and burrow management plans? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. We, we comment um, at every available opportunity. I, I think I still probably uh, am criticized a little bit by staff as saying, you know, hey, we got to fight. And I, I always say, who's our enemy and where's the fight? Because if this isn't, to Tom's point, I mean, we just had a meeting with the, the, the cattleman and state director from BLM was present and provided an update, and he's worked carefully with the cattleman and, and J.J. Gokachia in, in his roles uh, previously at Department of Ag. And, um, you know, I've, I've shared before, I, I've had conversations with past secretaries of interior and, and sat in the secretary's office and specifically addressed horses and burrows. And, and had Secretary Zinke just cite verse and chapter and cost and expense and um, Interior gets it, BLM gets it. Um, this is a, an issue of Congress and it's Congress not providing the BLM the appropriate tools to act. And so there's a, there's a fight. Um, we haven't been particularly effective and I, I think you know, maybe there are some avenues in, in the courts, but I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that the BLM understands the issue and they want and need tools too. And they have a plan on the table right now that could allow them to get to appropriate management levels down to that 11,746 or whatever it is in a five year period. But there's three alternatives out there on the table, five year, 10 year, 15 year, and they're, they're you know getting public comment. But I mean, that's one of the things that our habitat division does every day is, is providing that technical input and, and guidance in, in any proposed activity and, and you know horse impacts feature prominently in, in those comments and put a drought on top of it. So I don't know, I, I would invite uh, our habitat division administrator, Alan Janay, to maybe speak specifically to our, our engagement. If, if you're interested in the various places that we are engaged and how we, we you know, uh, try to affect um, land management decisions given the, the impacts that horses and burrows are on our wildlife and our, our habitats. Yeah, thank you for the record, Alan Janay, Habitat Division Administrator. And so to Tony's point, absolutely. Every time there's a proposed gather, we write a support letter um, encouraging BLM to you know, not only go forward with the gather, but again, try to get to AML. Um, but again, um, their abilities to, to actually fulfill that goal are greatly restricted um, by Congress and by their capacity within their system, which is controlled by Congress. So um, right now there isn't enough capacity in holding to even take off, you know, what's necessary in Nevada. So. Um, it's encouraging to see John Ravy as a state director put forward a plan, um, and that is very encouraging. But again, as is, uh, and now, you know, we continue to, to try to encourage them and try to support them. Um, I think it does add credibility when a wildlife agency writes you a letter of support, you know, in a legal, if they get into a legal fight, um, is that there is a letter in their record uh, supporting and, and addressing wildlife impacts. Beyond that, um, you know, we encourage them and have conversations with them and try to point out, uh, you know, hot spots on the landscape where we're seeing impacts. We've also worked with them uh, across the state on various springs and seeps where we're actually fencing and excluding, uh, you know, impacts and you know allowing water to flow off but uh, trying to protect and keep the resilience in those spring sources so that we don't lose them because we have seen that occur in the past so um, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach but it is it's a very frustrating uh, issue and we used to fight all the time that used to be you know and now this thing was rattle our sabers and and uh, you know go go about trying to fight it we were just beating up the people that we're really trying to, you know, we're relying on to try to implement the change. And so it, we've kind of changed our tact a little and now we're trying to support and trying to get them, you know, what they need from a wildlife agency to support what they do. And 
address those horse issues. Thank, thanks, Alan. And even you know, even the plan that's on the table, if they're able to get do the gathers, get the funding to, to conduct the gathers to get down to AML in five years, it's all contingent on them having the capacity to hold those animals in holding and would have to build a facility that would require, you know, significant capital and its construction and then ongoing overhead costs in feeding and maintaining those animals that would presumably, you know, eventually die of old age or be adopted, but there's a really small percentage that, that are suitable for that. Uh, and then try to use you know, birth control measures to control production out on, on the landscape. So if there was a, a clearer opponent with clearer strategies to engage in, in terms of a, of a fight, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we would be all in. Okay, any other questions or thoughts? Yes, Commissioner Allenberg. Yeah, I'd just like to, to thank uh, uh, Professor Street for the work and the presentation. It was very informative. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. All right. We're going to break for lunch. Um, the commission's staying in here for lunch. Everyone else is welcome to um, do whatever you do. Uh, it's 1235, so why don't we come back at 115? Thank you.